live. Bruce, check the YouTube channel. We are live. This is Seth David, your host from Nerd Enterprises Incorporated, hosting Nerd's Interview with a Guru series. Tonight we have a very special guest, but first I have to remind you that any advice you think you might have received tonight should be checked with a licensed professional in the appropriate area. This is for educational purposes only. And with that, we'll dive right into things. Uh, Bruce, thank you as always for being here and helping. And Kay, thank you so much for being with me today. Kay, for those of you who didn't get a chance to read it on my website, uh, Kay hosts a blog called Don't Mess With Taxes. And if I understand correctly, also contributes at bankrate.com. That's correct. Cool. Kay, thank you so much for being with us. Well, you can probably introduce yourself better than I can. Tell us who you are, what you do, and who you do it for. I am obviously a very inept technical person, which is kind of a dangerous thing for someone writing about taxes to admit, but given our little technical problems with me getting on, I'm a journalist by trade and training. I wrote for a newspaper, moved to D.C. in the early 80s when my husband got a job as a press secretary for a congressman there. I hooked up with another congressman who uh, worked on the Ways and Means Committee, which is the committee in the House that writes tax legislation. And that's sort of where my interest in taxes began. Uh, we stayed in D.C. almost 20 years, took a detour through Florida for six. The hurricanes drove us back to Texas in 2005, and that's when I started doing the blog, Don't Mess With Taxes. Got you. Okay. That was a lot in a short period of time. <laughs> so now... As far as your background goes, so you're not, I mean, you're, are you a licensed tax professional or you just have a lot of knowledge and experience from doing research on taxes? I am not a licensed tax professional, although my biggest compliment is that people often mistake me for being a tax professional or even a CPA, and I appreciate that. And I, I do attend training classes. I do get my little CPA credit certificates, even though I don't have to have them. I'm going next month to, uh, to your neck of the woods, Seth. I'm going to Southern California to an IRS uh, tax forum. I, I, I take the web uh, seminars. I, basically, I'm a journalist, and journalists are just voracious, crazy, information-seeking people, and I focus on taxes. So, um, you know, I always remind people, my job is to give them an idea of something to talk to their tax professional about. Right. So an IRS convention, that sounds absolutely fascinating. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to detect if there's irony or sarcasm in there, sarcasm, I guess. <laughs> well, you know, I was just recently at the Cal CPA convention, and it actually was a lot of fun, hanging out with a whole bunch of CPAs. It was a, it was a, it was a real fun networking opportunity. I'm not sure if the IRS thing will be the same, but... Uh, you know, and, of course, people were there for their CPE credits. They're continuing uh, practical education credits. Well, so the, great thing, the great thing about these forums, and the IRS hosts them every year, is that they have not only their people, their professionals there to give us some background, but they also get working professionals, which is key. You know, you want people there who are down and dirty, dealing with the screening clients, with, with arcane, obscure situations. They also present there. So, I mean, the IRS does a good job of rounding up people who are, who are tax professionals, who are CPAs, who are just accounts, who are enrolled agents, and get them to present uh, pro programs there at the, at the seminar, at the forums. Okay. So, so speaking of the IRS, let me just get down to brass tacks here. Let's get right to the bottom line of things. So uh, as somebody who, you know, as you put it, as a journalist, you know, who has a lot of experience and exposure to this world, is the IRS out to help me or to hurt me? The IRS is out to take as much of your money as they legally can. And that's, okay. you know, that's the bottom line and that's their job. That's what Congress is on their back to do all the time. Unfortunately, Congress doesn't make it easy for them. And I always tell people, they can complain about the IRS and sometimes those complaints are legitimate. I mean, Sometimes IRS employees, like employees everywhere, do a crappy job. They, they're rude. They don't know what they're doing. They're tired. They're fed up. They do a bad job. And, and that's something the IRS has to deal with in its personnel situation. But the IRS has the job of trying to implement in the laws that Congress comes up with. And that's who people really need to be on 
need to complain about. Congress is always screwing around with tax laws. They are doing it in silly ways, which means making the laws temporary, letting them expire, coming back to them retroactively, which they're going to be doing here in a few months with extenders. They're, they're parsing them with a budget in mind so that they do ridiculous things with a tax law because it might produce a budget. They start with a budget goal and then mess with the tax laws to try to get to that goal. So, I mean, you know, you obviously the IRS is, is an easy target and sometimes it is a legitimate target, but basically they're, they're in as tough a place as we are in trying to just pay as little as we legally can. They're trying to deal with the same crazy, confusing IRS uh, tax laws to get the most, because if they don't, then Congress is going to yell at them. Right, right. And as far as, you know, like you, you said, you, they're, make, they're passing a lot of laws that are temporary, and then they have to decide if they're going to, you know, uh, what do you call it, reinstate them or, yeah. or let them kind of expire. Why do you think that is? is it, do you think it's because they're afraid of what the consequences are and they want to kind of test it out to see if its impact is what they anticipated? Why do you think they're doing that? I think a lot of it began... It, it, it's always centered on budgets, in which I always I get a kick with all this this talk about the federal deficit, which is a legitimate concern that we all should have. You know, the federal deficit is something we need to, to talk about. But Congress looks at tax laws as a way that they can play with the budget and get the numbers they want, as long as they do it in a short term. And it's always, you know, it, it's sort of uh, that way it'll be someone else's problem. And, I, and then once they do a tax law, it's very hard to give someone, to give people, to give voters tax breaks and then yank them back. So it will be very interesting. We have a lot of new people in Congress and we may have even more new people in Congress come November who say they are determined to do some major changes. And some of those major changes will be yanking back some tax benefits that that you and I, and especially companies and trade groups, are very, very uh, favorable toward and very much want to see stay on the book. So it's going to be an interesting dynamic to see what happens after the election and, and who, how much willpower these people have to walk the talk that they're now saying as they're trying to get or stay elected. Right, right. And uh, let me ask you something, kind of shift gears a little bit on this. I heard, my wife actually heard this, she mentioned to me, and uh, I'm wondering if you know anything about it, that Congress at present is sitting on a fund of some like $38 billion or something ridiculous that's supposed to be meant to help people with their, uh, you know, home loans that they for some reason haven't actually dispersed yet. Do you know anything about that? Um, I, am, I am familiar with it, not the specifics. One of my colleagues at Bankrate has dealt with it. It, it, the problem is here, this is a fund to help people, is, is, I believe this is what she's she probably talking about, to help people who can get their loans refinanced and uh, modified to help them when they're underwater, which is a big problem all, all, all over the, the country, but especially in uh, areas like California and Nevada and Florida. But um, it's kind of the, the rules are precise and exact, and there wasn't a lot of attention given, a lot of uh, notice given on this, and it had a time limit, or it has a time limit. Again, I'm not sure of the specifics, mm -hmm. but because the time limit's coming up, a lot of that money is just not going to go to what it was intended to be done. Right. That's, well, that's unfortunate, because that sounds like a lot of money that could really help a lot yeah. of people. So... All right, let's go back to taxes then, and uh, tell me what's going on lately. Let me leave it a little open-ended. Tell me, tell me what the latest issues are. What do you see as somebody who you know uh, researches and writes about this all the time? What do you think are the most important issues that you know people like you and me as lay people should understand and be aware of? Well, um, I'll, I'll try not to get too wonky. I haven't spent 20 years in Washington. I I, I often want to just go right to the political side of it, which is Interesting, it does uh, affect us, but I know people want down in, in practical application. But I do think right now what we need to pay attention to is what's going to happen with the upcoming expiration of the tax laws. Again, as I said, there was uh, Congress has this um, pension to set a limit and let it expire and let somebody else worry about it. And I mean, that was almost 
the brilliance of the tax cuts that were initiated under Bush in 2001 and 2003, they had this sunsetting provision. And now we're in a tax year, and I know Bruce could probably attest to this. You've got people who are beginning to worry, are my taxes going to go up? Because we hear a lot about the, the taxes on the higher in income individuals. Definitely they will face higher taxes, but we tend to forget that the tax cuts that took effect in 2001, the Bush tax cuts, for want of a better phrase, although they are now the Bush-Obama tax cuts since they were extended, that includes a 10% tax rate that didn't exist. And that means that all of us are going to get hit with higher taxes, even if we were still just going to be in the, the income tax rates that weren't going to go up, because we're going to lose that 10% cushion for a little bit of income there in the beginning. Um, I think we need to pay attention to that. And um, a lot of people have money in, they have switched because the investments, the equities have been kind of volatile and scary and up and down. They've gone to uh, dividend paying things that they thought they could just at least get some income out of that. The dividend tax there is now for on certain dividends is 15%, which is the same as capital gains. If that goes away, then people are going to be stuck with these, these investments that they wanted to be getting income from, and now they're going to be paying higher taxes on. And also that could affect the value of the funds. You, you have people who might be... Um, Maybe their only investments are in their 401 ks and, uh, and IRAs, but those are going to be affected with the tax rates go up and people start shifting around in the market, then the value of those retirement funds are going to be affected. So I think the big concern here is that we need a little certainty, which again is, is a word that Congress doesn't really seem to grasp, but I don't think we're going to have what's being called tax Taxmageddon in, in January 2013. I think regardless of who's in the White House, um, we're going to get another short term, at least a year, probably in exchange for that payroll tax staying at 4.2% instead of 6.2%. But I think people need to try to get the word to Congress that they need to have something done sooner rather than later because this uncertainty isn't good for anyone. Right, and and you, honest, I'm curious, honest opinion, the payroll tax thing. Do you think it's actually helping? Is it really making a difference? Um, I don't think it's helping as much as they hope. I mean, it, you know, they use that fifty thousand, a thousand dollars for somebody who's making fifty thousand. Um, in a lot of the country, a lot of people aren't making fifty thousand, so they're not getting that money, and I don't think they recognize it on a week-to-week -week basis like they did when they got rebate checks, which happened during the Bush administration. Not a big fan of the rebate checks either. Those created their own sets of confusion. But um, I don't think people now, it's just sort of been absorbed into their daily living. So I don't think it's really helping like it was intended to. We haven't seen a big uptick in spending, which was supposed to be the idea. You get this extra money, people then go out and spend it and get the economy going again. So. I don't think it's helping on the economy, and it's definitely not helping with the long-term Social Security. The, the question is, again, are lawmakers or politicians willing to gain back any kind of tax break, even one that people maybe don't even, aren't even appreciating that much? It's, it's going to be hard to get that kick back up to two percentage points again. Right. I, I think it has to be substantial in order for somebody to really say, oh, well, I've got all this extra money, I'm going to go spend it. And for the sake of those watching who may not be 100% clear on what we're talking about, one of the uh, tax plans um, was, well, actually, Kay, why don't you explain it? Because you, I'm sure you can explain it better than I can. You're the expert. <laughs> oh, okay. You're talking about the payroll tax now? Yeah, yeah. Explain that for the viewers in case, because there may be people who have no idea what we're talking about. Sure. Uh, if, when, when you have a, when you work for an employer, you get, you see that, that the joke about I don't know who Faki is, but why is he getting so much of my money? You get uh, you come out of your out of your pay every paycheck, a percentage of income comes out to go towards Social Security and towards Medicare. And the Social Security percentage that the employee play, pays or used to pay is 6.2 percent, and that's matched by the employer. And then there's the Medicare portions too. The payroll tax holiday, which is what it's technically called reduce that 6.2% on the employee side to 4.2%. So that's a little less money coming out of each paycheck. Employers are still putting in the same amount. And it just gives you a few more dollars each paycheck because less is going to pay for the Social Security 
benefits in the right. future. Right. And so because it's just a few dollars each paycheck, I don't think people feel it enough to say, oh, hey, let's go out, let's go shopping, you know? <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it's a couple of dollars, and, it, and it's like when you get your, I know what it is, I like to look at it as when I get my, my phone bill, my cell phone bill. It's a million things, and every month it's a little few cents more, it's never a few cents less, but it's a few cents more, because you're always just kind of fudging around with some fees and excise taxes, and it's the same way here. You go, oh, it's a little more, so what? And you move on. It, you just, it doesn't make a big impact. You're right. It needs to be substantial to get people thinking about it and get it to do what they wanted it to do. Right. And then do you think it's fair to say, I hear this a lot. Um, in fact, just recently I was uh, talking with a CPA out here who his whole client base are basically very high net worth individuals. And he made a comment to me that was interesting. It didn't shock me at all you know, to hear him say this, but basically his comment was something like, don't kid yourself, the wealthy do not pay that much taxes. And the, the people on the poor end, the people who aren't making that much money or none at all, aren't paying taxes either because there's no income to pay taxes on, so that the ones who are hit the hardest are the ones, the middle class. Is, I mean, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, that, that's a good analysis. I mean, honestly, people on the high end, as Warren Buffett pointed out, and caught so much heat because it was, I don't know why they thought it was a secret. It's not a secret. People with a lot of money have money to invest. And as we talked about earlier, that's at a, at a preferable tax rate. I think uh, capital gains, lower capital gains tax rates are so, something to be kept. I mean, there's something to be said for giving people a, a benefit to give money to be invested in, in companies and in situations to help grow uh, employers and grow corporations. So rich people have more disposable income to invest, so they're putting it into to, uh, vehicles that, that are, are tax less. And like you said, lower income people don't make a lot of money, so they're either tax less or they don't pay, as, as we've heard, they don't pay income taxes at all, although they still get the uh, payroll taxes, the, the Social Security component comes out. So those of us who are sort of the big lump in the middle, are sort of shouldering more and more of the burden, which has, I think, sort of been the impetus of late for tax reform. There's, you know, a lot of frustration about, well, we're paying this all. We need to get this done so that we can get some of the benefits. Now, that's a whole another problem. And, you know, fair and is what's fair for one person is not necessarily fair for another one. <laughs> you get into lots of, uh, lots of uh, not just fiscal, but... Uh, philosophical debates here when you start talking about tax. Right, things. of course. Yeah, and I've heard many of them already. In fact, I was at a seminar uh, about a year and a half ago that a guy gave on investments and people were asking questions about, you know, taxes and tax implications and, you know, where the economy was going in general. And this gentleman's comment was an interesting one, actually. Um, you know, he's a guy who manages a very big investment portfolio and, and he's got a CPA slash tax background. And his comment was, and I'm wondering if you agree with this or not, but his comment essentially was that in the big picture, the IRS, maybe it's not the right word, but for lack of a better phrase, almost doesn't care about our individual taxes. Where they're making their money is off the taxes they get from the big corporations. And that can swing things substantially one way or the other because one year you take a big company like Microsoft and they might have a ton of write-offs so they may show no income and pay no taxes but then the next year they show billions of dollars in income and pay taxes on that and then that's what's going to make the difference in other words between the IRS being able to, you know, or, or our country for that matter on the whole being able to get bailed out of this economic crisis is the tax dollars that the IRS collects on big, big, big corporations like Microsoft and Google. What, what do you think? I think that is a large chunk, and obviously it's a large chunk that's not being collected, as, as we've seen from, from the ability of these large corporations to utilize legitimate tax breaks to, to uh, incorporate, to, to put subsidiaries in other countries, and to get out of uh, the U.S. tax uh, situation with, with no tax liability or sometimes even refunds. Um, obviously, corporate tax system needs to be overhauled as well as the individual tax system. Uh, the, there's been a, an inclination to do the corporate tax uh, reform first. Uh, I think they feel like they can, they can herd the cats that are the corporations a little easier than the millions of us who are uh, individual taxpayers. 
Um, I'm not sure, though, they're going to get as big of reform as they think. I mean, if, if I was GE or Apple or Microsoft, and right now the tax code was allowing me to get away without paying that much money, I don't think I would be a big fan of having it rewritten. You know, I, you hear a lot of talk about reform on the individual side, but it's from individuals who are every year looking at their they're 1040 and going, oh my gosh, look how much money I had to pay. Yeah, I may be getting a refund, but look at the thousands I had to pay to even get before I got some of it back. So um, I, it's true, you know, it, it's a, it, the, the economics of scale there, where you have the really big companies, will get you the really big, the big money for the treasury. But it's going to be a hard, hard road to get the corporate tax. Reformed, and, and as I understand it, that's really where they want to start is with corporate reform. Right. Well, it seems to me that that would make more sense. A dollar for dollar, they have potential to collect a heck of a lot more money there than they do from individuals. Um, you know, just because you're dealing with a much big, much bigger pool of dollars to begin with. So True. If, any, if everything ultimately is based on a percentage of that pool, you go for the ocean instead of the pond, right? That that's a that's a great analogy, but you know, I guess uh, maybe I spent 19 uh, years too long in DC. I'm a little cynical. I I know <laughs> they've got all the, the the big companies also, as we talked about, have the really really capable attorneys and accountants and lobbyists in DC. So it's going to be an interesting battle to see what comes out of that. But you're right. That's where you start, and that you know that is basically the IRS's. Uh, approach with a lot of tax laws, even on the individual basis. It's, it's sort of that uh, D.B. Cooper, you know, uh, the, well, not D.B. Cooper, the, the guy who said, well, he said, some sudden who said, you know, I rob banks because that's where the money is. You know, the IRS does tend to audit richer taxpayers because they have a better chance of getting a bigger payout from them. So going right. with the, the big corporations is, is the wiser move. I, I'm just a little a little skeptical as to how much change they can really get out of that. Well, yeah, and of course, that's the classic problem is the corporations, while they would be the best candidate for, you know, being sort of taxed, they also have the uh, greatest uh, means with which to fight against that. Exactly. So at the end of the day, it may be more cost effective for the IRS to just go after the individuals who can't afford it to get that kind of representation. So, and, and then I guess another question I always have swimming around my mind when it comes to just our national deficit and you know, and, and how taxes might be able, you know, might play into that. Do you think it's largely an issue of collection or lack of collection versus actual tax assessments? I mean, I would imagine the IRS has huge receivables. Um, I think collections are a bit of the problem, but I also think that um, people are making a lot of, there are a lot of mistakes being made unintentionally, true mistakes where the IRS isn't getting the money it needs because the system is complicated, because they're, even with, with tax software, you, when we have a lot of people who instead of going to tax professionals are using tax software and they're making mistakes which to their benefit they're, they're not paying as much but it is costing. So I think there's a lot to be said for the IRS to to get beyond this complication. I, I think truly that uh, Commissioner Shulman and his people really would like a simpler tax code, both corporate and individual, because it would be less for them to fight about and it would be more black and white as to who owes what in getting that drawn in. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but I mean, Shulman, he's going to be out of office before this ever takes place, but he's trying to move to what he's calling a real-time tax collection system. Right now, when you file your taxes, you make a mistake or you intentionally try to, to push the envelope there, you don't hear about it probably for years after it happened. You know, they've got that three-year window. They'll come back and three years ago, oh, we found this mistake and we need to work that out. He wants to set up a system where things are matched, uh, 1099s, W-2s, all those are matched immediately so you don't have any of these issues and those questions are, are resolved from the get-go. So you don't have this lack of money that should have been brought in years ago. You get it from the beginning. And I think this is a laudable attempt. And, and I think it would, while it would frustrate a lot of taxpayers who might see their immediate return slow down, it also would get rid of those surprises that show up years later. 
Okay, interesting. And you mentioned, you know, you mentioned about people using uh, tax software and such. So let's talk about that for a minute because I know this was a, a really good conversation we had in Bruce's tax hangout a few weeks ago. We were talking about essentially the different sort of forms of of people or or things that you one could use to get their taxes filed. Sh so let's start with the simplest. Should anyone be using a box to do their taxes? I mean, should anyone be using TurboTax? Um, yeah, I think for people who are, have very basic returns, uh, you know, no dependents or just one or two dependents, no uh, taking the standard deduction. I mean, the, the beauty of that is that you just get the calculations. When it's simple, you know, then then that does everything for you. Um, at the problem, though, with all with everything, with all the software, is garbage in, garbage out. So mm -hmm. if you mess up, but if all you're doing is entering in W two information, you have two kids, you're taking the standard deduction, you want to e file it, you can use the software. Of course, uh, the IRS now has the free file for a lot of these people, which then you can do that without any cost. And I know some of the companies have, uh, have tried to fight that by, by uh, giving free file anyway, even to people who aren't eligible for the free file program. But uh, I think software does work for some people, and mainly for the addition portion of the built-in calculators. Mm -hmm. So, but we're talking, just to be clear, for people who, to use a program where there's no human interaction, nobody really analyzing things, we're talking very, very, very simple scenario. I have a straight W-2, maybe I have a couple of kids, I'm filing a standard deduction so I don't own a home, I'm not deducting mortgage interest, I don't have any investment portfolios, like real, real simple, right? Yeah, yeah. And now, and then so, let's just, for lack of a better way to outline it, let's move up one level, let's call it, and let's talk about... Um, non-CPA tax preparers. Sorry, Bruce. I don't mean to put you guys in a box like that. But we have a few uh, things now. We have enrolled agents like Bruce, who's licensed essentially by the federal government to prepare tax returns, right? And then we have the new one, which Bruce, what is it called again? The registered tax return preparer or something? Yeah. It's yeah. called a registered tax yes. return preparer. Yes. Okay, so, Kay, what is that? Explain that to us. And wh why do we need it? If we have enrolled agents doing tax returns, we have CPAs, why, what do I need this for? What's the point of it? The point of this is uh, the IRS has, has seen over the years a lot of these fly-by-night groups pop up during tax season. Come to our, to our car dealership outside town and we'll have Bill Jones, who will do your taxes and get you your refund and will use that to buy your car. We have people who are opening up shop and uh, they show up, people who are afraid of doing their own taxes, who don't have a computer, don't feel com uh, comfortable even doing it with uh, the software on their own computer. They want, to, they want to have a person to talk with about their taxes. And the IRS said that they were seeing too many of these people show up who really weren't trained to do taxes but we're taking people's returns and filling them in, a lot of them using software themselves, and sending it off to them, collecting a fee, filing things improperly, cheating people out of proper uh, refund money or, or having them pay too big of uh, taxes, or worse, being just flat out criminals and using these people as a way for them to get money themselves, you know, fabricating things, uh, sometimes with the knowledge of the taxpayer, sometimes without the knowledge of the taxpayer, but just to bulk up with refund amounts for which these these uh, refund prepare these tax preparers then get a cut of that refund. So the IRS said the the best way to keep that from happening is to make sure that we know who these people are, that we ensure that they have some at least some bit of training, and that we can make sure that they are responsible for what they're doing. So they have started this process now where all tax preparers who file returns must get a, a paid tax preparer identification number and um, use that to file the return. And the IRS is going to make them pass tests to ensure that they know at least the basics of what they're talking about. It, you know, I think the goal here for the IRS was um, I know a lot of tax preparers were freaking out, and rightfully so. I mean, who needs another person looking over your shoulder 
and you're trying to do your job, but unfortunately, the people who do their job properly and fairly and responsibly, we often end up having to pay the price of those people who are trying to, to gain the system or cheat the system, and that's what's happened here with this. So basically, the IRS is trying to get rid of these people who don't know what they're doing or who, or who are flat out tax crooks who are trying to use taxes to make money off of Uncle Sam and off of the taxpayers. Okay, and so the obvious question that enters my mind, I would imagine anybody else is listening, is why not just, I mean, we have enrolled agents. What do we need this for? So I guess the obvious question then is what's the difference then between, I mean, is it just, do you, is there, are there fewer requirements to become a registered tax preparer compared with becoming an enrolled agent? Is that why? So that they made it easy for people who are basically scamming to do tax returns to get some kind of certification so that there's some assurance that they had some training. Is that, I mean, is that essentially what yeah. that is? If you look at it, you know, I, I don't, there, there's, you start with taxes and you have the, the software that, that any person can buy and use. Then you have uh, the term preparers, many of whom are, uh, are, are trained, um, most of whom are accountants or, ha or have some financial background. Then you have enrolled agents and CPAs and tax attorneys, and those are areas where there's additional testing there are additional responsibilities, uh, there's continuing education, there's a, a professional group that wants to maintain the integrity of those groups, of enrolled agents, of CPAs, of tax attorneys. So they require the continuing education. Now those people are not involved in these, these uh, registered tax preparer requirements because they are getting their own requirements met through the continuing education. It's already uh, in place under their professional organizations. So, uh, you know, in, in, in enrolled agents and uh, CPAs and tax attorneys, they can represent you before a tax, before the IRS when you have problems. So it's a level of what you as a tax, uh, tax uh, payer want to have doing your taxes, what kind of a person, what kind of training you're more comfortable with. Right, right. So I'm, I'm, gu I'm guessing it follows then that the registered tax term preparer is going to have, generally speaking, lower fees than an enrolled agent who's going to have lower fees than a CPA who's going to have lower fees than a tax attorney. I mean, exactly. that's pretty much how it falls down. So, I mean, what, I mean and if, if, if you don't want to answer this, I understand completely, but I'm curious what your opinion is. Is the idea of having a registered tax return preparer filing my tax return scary? Should I just go with an enrolled agent or is there some merit to this? Again, you know, it, it all comes down, if, if, you, uh, if, if your mother-in-law has been doing your taxes forever and she's an accountant but not a CPA and now she's a prepared, now she's got her, her, her tax number from the IRS, keep using your mother-in-law, you know, she, she's mm -hmm. great. You, you keep your, your wife or your husband happy and, and everything will work out fine. Um, I personally still do my own taxes, but I know if I was going to take it to someone, I would probably go personally to someone who had more formal training just because I watch and I see how the, the things change every year in, in the tax world. So I would feel a little more comfortable knowing that, that I had an EA or CPA or an attorney who specializes in taxes and was on top of the tax changes in the tax world and, and would know more about these things than say my, my mother-in-law would know. Gotcha. Gotcha. Interesting. And and so, you know, then the other thing that comes to mind on the other, well, first of all, actually, before I forget, because I keep forgetting to go back to this, when I walk into H and R Block, what is their training? Are they enrolled agents? Um, it, it depends. Some of the people who are staffers on there, full time staffers, they they do have training. They are, you know, good people who've been doing this for years. It is their career. They get their training. Some of them are are. Uh, are accountants and enrolled agents, but a lot of the people that are hired seasonally are not. They come in, they and I did this years ago. I did a, a training class with H&R Block, and I, I did a training class with Jackson Hewitt a couple of years ago. And to be honest, it scared me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, it's a, no, I, I mean, there are lots of good people who work for those for those franchises. Mm -hmm. But looking at the training, I, I was, I was, I had wished it had been a little tougher personally. 
Right. Um, right. So I, I would, you know, again, today, HR Block, the franchise groups are really good for somebody who, again, has a relatively simple return. And basically, a lot of people who go to the franchises are drawn there because they want to get their refunds quickly. And these groups, even though they're not offering strict refund anticipation loans anymore, they do offer uh, debit cards that get this money back to the people more quickly. And a lot of people who use these franchises are, are folks who don't have bank accounts because they don't have enough money to keep in a bank account. They would be eaten alive by thieves. So that they need, it, I think is what we call it, bank rate the unbanked. And, and this is, is a mechanism for these folks to go and get their taxes done and then get, um, get their refund more quickly. And then I think most of them use debit cards now as a way to get the refunds to the people. Right, right. I, it's interesting. I remember a couple of years ago, I was working with a company who was looking to put these programs together with, directly with payroll companies. Where, there, where the employee's payroll would be automatically uh, deposited onto like a prepaid debit card. Mm -hmm. And that way they didn't have to go to a, ca a check cashing place and they didn't have to worry about any of that. I thought it was a great idea you know, for a program like that. And then at the end of the year, because all their payroll was run through this one card, the information would be compiled in a heartbeat for them to get their taxes done. So that it, it theoretically should have simplified that process. No, and I think that's a great idea. And unfortunately, the IRS actually tried this year, uh, last year, to send out refunds instead of by check, tried to encourage people to get their refunds on debit cards, which would help people who did not have bank accounts, who, who, didn't have, who were going to have to pay a fee to a check cashing service if they got a paper check. And there really wasn't a lot of interest in it. And I was, I was astounded. I thought, man, this is great. The IRS is coming to the 21st century. People are using you know, digital movement of money, uh, debit cards are great, everybody knows how to use them. And people just, I don't know if it was distrust of uh, uh, anything that the government says is there to help them, or if it was um, perhaps the debit cards, they, they had a variety of them, and there were fees associated with that, so there, there might have been some problems with that too. But, I was really disappointed that there wasn't more of a public uh, embrace of this debit card, tax return by debit card. Yeah. I think it's going to eventually come back because, you know, the, the government's trying to get everything to be not paper anymore. So I think eventually that is how the IRS is going to end up sending out refunds in a few years. But right now there's still some resistance to it. Right. Well, you know, one of my clients that we were looking into doing this with is probably a perfect example of the answer to your question about why the interest wasn't there. It was a construction company. And so, you you know, most of the employees are people who work on the job sites, you know, swinging a hammer. These are not people who make a fortune. Right. And a lot of them live check to check. And the feedback I got from the foreman at this construction company on these jobs was that knowing his guys, most of them prefer to cash the check and keep the ca check under the mattress. They just don't trust the, bank, the, the banking system, right. you know, period. They, they like having their cash, and, you know, that's how they, they know. If, if they've got cash, they've got their money. They don't have to worry about somebody ever turning around and saying, oh, sorry, you know, uh, we're closing the doors. There's no money in your account. No, you know? that's a good point, and unfortunately, after the bank meltdown a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it probably <laughs> solidified those fears. <laughs> so... Um, Another question now, talking about where we draw the line between when I might go to an enrolled agent versus when I might need to hire a CPA or a tax attorney. I know a lot of people in my world. These are people who own, you know, small to medium-sized businesses. Most of them seem to have the mentality that it's like they don't even think twice. They just they get a CPA. You've got to have a CPA to do your taxes. And quite frankly, after having met Bruce and gotten to know Bruce, I've learned to feel differently about this. In fact, I think Bruce has done a very good job of convincing me that not only isn't it necessarily better to go to a CPA, in many cases it might be better to go to an enrolled agent just because for an enrolled agent, taxes are all they do, whereas a CPA might have their hands in other things and they're not necessarily focused on just taxes. So it follows logically, I think, and I'm wondering what you think about this, that wouldn't I rather have somebody whose whole entire purpose in life is doing taxes as opposed to somebody who might be spread, you know, out, um, you know, around other things. 
What do you What do you think? No, that, that's a great point. I mean, that's one of the key things to look at when you are looking to hire a tax professional. And uh, and old agents uh, often they're, they're kind of a quiet group. Uh, uh, Bruce is a bit of an exception here. He, he's a little wild and crazy, but I uh, you know I know a lot of EAs, and, and they're just they're really focused on their job. And they are not really ones to get out there and toot their horn. But the the EA group, it, it's it's a very uh, it has, its its roots are very old. It, they've been around forever. Um, what you really need to look at, regardless of what uh, credentials you do want, if you're going to to go as an individual or as a business to a tax professional, you need to look at does that person is that person familiar with my tax situation. Am I a small business? Am I a small business that's labor intensive? Uh, do, do they understand that kind of business? Um, again, like you say, accountants accountants look at bottom lines and the numbers crunchers, but you need to find out. Do, you just want to make sure that they are familiar with your type of business or your personal filing situation before you hire them. Too many people see, you know, they see the 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 letters after the name. Or they even see the, the amount they pay and they think, oh, I'm paying more, it's got to be better. Um, that's not necessarily true. I mean, I, even in this, this budget time of frame of mind that we're in, some people think, well, you know, I'm paying this guy this much money, he's going to do a great job. You really need to sit down and thoroughly talk to these people and see that they really do know what you're doing and what your goals are for your, your business and as an individual, are you trying to to find tax situations that help you save money for your kids' education? Are you investing money? And what is, what's going to happen there tax-wise? So I, I think that the key here is to realize that tax professionals and within all the disciplines are individuals too. And you need to find one that meshes with, with your personal goals and your personal tax situation. So in other words, I should sit down with the person who's going to do my taxes ahead of time and ask them a bunch of questions, really, to find exactly. out what their experience is. Do they have experience with companies like mine or situations like mine? Exactly. And you know, a, a business, if you're a business person and you're in a professional group, a trade organization, maybe you have monthly meetings, luncheon meetings to talk about things in, in, in your profession. Ask your, your peers, ask your colleagues, who do you use to do your taxes? Why did you like that person? Why did you quit using this person? And, and you know, personal recommendations are, are good indicators of, uh, of the job you're going to get because if somebody's doing a good job for a person, the people are happy to tell other people about it. Right, and of course that's true everywhere. You, exactly. you know, if you can get a referral from somebody who can sort of vouch for that person, whatever that, that whatever kind of help it is that you're looking for, that's always better. So shouldn't everybody just hire Bruce? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Bruce would love to, to be dealing with taxes from all the, the 43 states that <laughs> collect those income taxes. <laughs> As long as each of them comes in with the right tax guides to tell Bruce how to do them. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I keep joking about that with Bruce because he had somebody actually do that to him this year. He had somebody walk in with a, a book and ask him if he knew about these tax codes. Well, I'm sure that, that Bruce, I'm sure that, that me and my fellow tax bloggers are probably a big pain in the side for a lot of tax professionals. And I apologize, Bruce, but, you know, I guess my, my goal is to give people an idea of, of the possibilities out there, and then you take that and you make sure that your tax professional tells you whether or whether or not that situation does indeed apply to your individual situation. <laughs> so. Right. So, um, by the way, I'm looking at our YouTube uh, feed. Bruce, it looks like we've got a couple of comments here. Oh, this is funny. <laughs> Obviously a friend of yours. <laughs> <laughs> a client, maybe. <laughs> Not a question, just a comment. Adding my two cents, I think there should be more credits for families with special needs kids. I spend far more than I do a normal kid. Actually, that's an interesting topic, Kay. Let's talk about that for a minute. What, what, what kind of credits are there out there and help is there out there tax-wise for, for actually there's two questions. One is, you know, leading into what she was asking for special needs kids. And then I have another question. I want to know what the most bizarre kind of credit or deduction one has, in your experience, one has ever taken. I want the most bizarre deduction. 
But first, let's talk about special needs kids. Well, uh, I, I, I might push this over the bruise here because, you know, at not being a retail tax preparer, I, I know that um, there are a lot of uh, special needs kids. The, the education issue, there are some education credits you can get for, for helping kids. And there are some medical uh, tax breaks when a, when a child needs some special uh, medical treatments. But it's true, there aren't a lot in that area. We've got, you know, basically we have the child tax credit for just having the kid, and then you have the care credit. But there's not a lot that are tailored for special needs. And I, I think part of the problem here is that it's such a broad area that I think Congress is a little leery of getting specific here. That you know, if they they open it up too much, then again we get into that budget situation of what is this going to cost. So every time we do that, um, as for bizarre credits, um, <laughs> I think a lot of people tend to try to turn hobbies into businesses and mess that up and and start trying to, to run a business that's really a hobby and write those losses off, and I think that creates a lot of problems. Okay. So, Bruce, in your experience, what's the most bizarre credit or tax deduction someone has either taken or tried to take? The one that's foremost right now would be the uh, television newcaster that thought she ought to deduct her thongs that she <laughs> bought. <laughs> and what was the uh, justification for that? And she had to have underwear to wear to work. <laughs> so was she a client of yours, Bruce, or is this just a... <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's somebody I know. You know, that, that, there's the, the, you're talking about that, too. The, uh, that, that's when little people think that, you know, your work clothes, because you have to look uh, better than, than the T-shirt I'm wearing today on, on this uh, webcast that you, you need those special... Uh, um, they consider it a uniform, but it's not only those uniform right. things that are deductible. Um, I, you know, I think the, the recent one, there was a recent one where uh, um, people who, we always get this every year, people who give their houses to fire departments so that they can burn them down and then the people can have the land cleared and build a new house on it. And they want to take a charitable deduction for doing that. Um, you know, that's... Uh, that's been allowed, but only if you get a proper appraisal and follow the, the rules precisely and get all the I's dotted and the T's crossed before it happens. But every year you see somebody who donates the house that they're going to match it out on to the fire department to have it burned down, and then they try to write off the hundreds of thousands of dollars of the property, and the IRS slaps them back. So. Right. I mean, look, let's face it, there are definitely some deductions that apply in very specific niches, right? I mean, I know mm -hmm. I've had clients in the entertainment industry that, that deduct, legitimately deduct their gym memberships because they arguably do need to be in shape to be in their movies and their TV shows mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So there are certain cases where things that you and I could never deduct, other people can, and it makes sense and it's appropriate. So and of course I love to bring up the uh, the famous case of the uh, stripper who wanted to you know deduct her her breast enlargements um, as and you know so then we were joking around recently about that one that um, you know what's the useful life on that asset how, you know how long do you depreciate it for <laughs> you know that's the that's the great point I mean taxes are very personal they're very individual. So you need to, to look at what your situation is and, again, talk with a tax professional who is well-versed in that. And then the other thing here is to keep your documentation because whenever you go to, uh, to argue it, I mean, we're all raised here in the United States innocent until proven guilty, except that's not the way it is in the tax world. When the IRS thinks you've done something wrong, then you're guilty until you can prove to the IRS that you are innocent of trying to cheat them. So, you know get your documentation together, hire a good professional if you're ever going to try to get creative out there. Right. Because the IRS is a collection agency. It's not a... Not a court. <laughs> right. So, and like you said at the very beginning, their objective is to collect as much of tax mm -hmm. revenue as they possibly can. So they're going to try and dispute everything that you're going to try and claim, <laughs> you know, exactly. as much as possible. So that's a good note, I think, to end off on. Uh, as far as documentation... Uh, I mean, I think it goes without saying, you need to have it. Um, and I know a lot of people ask the questions, and I love to talk about this one. 
you know, the, are my, why can't I just have my credit card statements? Why do I need my receipts? And the answer, of course, is that your receipts actually explain what you bought, not just where you spent the money. Exactly. And it can make the difference between, like, office supplies or food, you know, which is only going to be 50% deductible in many cases. So uh, what else? Tell us what else. Uh, it's something that might not be obvious as far as what we would want to do. Um, and then mileage logs. I mean, most people I know don't keep them. And then when the audit comes around, what they do is they sit there using Google Maps to try, because most of us keep calendars, so we can always go back and see where we went. And they'll put it together based on using Google Maps to see, all right, how many miles is it? Let's add it all up. And I know one guy who literally had to spend 40 hours putting together his mileage logs based on, uh, at the time he was using MapQuest and his calendar. I mean, so what, what, what say you? What I say is I have finally got myself in the habit of hitting that odometer, zeroing it out every time I get it in and out of the car. <laughs> Even when I do my personal business in my car, I go to the grocery store, I still zero that out so that I know the next time I get in it and I'm going to do a business, a legitimate business trip, uh, business travel, it starts at zero. I, what I like to do is write my mileage down. I, I keep a little notebook in, in my car. I'm still very paper intensive. But I also write it down on the back of that receipt when I get home. Then I have the mileage for that trip that I went to that meeting. And I have the receipt from the restaurant for the meal that I bought, a potential client. And it also has the mileage for that. So it's all there on that one document. So uh, I think the key is just to get yourself in the habit of doing it contemporaneously. This used to be a big watchword of the IRS. It, you don't hear it a lot anymore because they heard so many people who were able to do with the advent of MapQuest to, to kind of backtrack. But really, contemporaneous record keeping is the best because A, it's the most accurate. It ensures you don't forget something. And it, it's, it's fresh in your mind. And you know exactly you have all the details of what you did that's tax deductible. The other thing I like to remind people, too, when they feel like they're drowning in paper, the IRS does accept digital records. So if you think you're, you're just overwhelmed with all these receipts, Scan them in. There are lots of uh, 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 receipt programs and, and hardware that can take care of this. And that way, you'll have it all online, all in a diskette, uh, on a flash drive. And you don't have to mess with all those boxes that, that Bruce is probably used to seeing every <laughs> April. So, you know, it's, just, it's handier, it's easier, it's neater. Right. Well, anybody who spends five minutes on my YouTube channel knows I'm a big fan of shoebox.com. You know, which is uh, here. You basically stuff your receipts yeah. in their envelope, and you mail it in. And within a week or two, they have it all scanned. Everything is very well named and documented. And then I archive it in Evernote. So I've got my permanent record right there. I mean, it's available permanently online through Shoebox, too. But I like having it in Evernote because it syncs to my desktop. But then here's my version of what you do as far as mileage logs go is because I like to use Evernote, and that's the other thing that you don't have to spend five minutes around my YouTube channel to figure out I'm in love with. But what I would do, and I don't really travel to see clients anymore like I used to. Most of my stuff is done from home. It's very rare. It takes a lot for a client to get me out of my house these days. <laughs> but when I do, if I, or if I was doing it regularly enough that I felt I needed to keep mileage logs, what I would probably do now is using Evernote, snapshot of the odometer before I leave, Snapshot of the odometer after I return, and then detailed notes right in Evernote about who I went to see and what the purpose was. Great idea, great idea. And that way, you can't really argue with that. I, mean, yeah, I suppose I could fudge the odometer <laughs> photo, but that would be a, a great length to go to for something like just to get a few pennies off of my gas deduction or whatever it comes out to. But no, anyway. even if it's diligence like that, I, I'm sure Bruce could con attest to this. If that's the kind of thing that's going to convince an IRS examiner that, okay, this guy's not trying to cheat us because look what he's doing. He's, he's taking these steps. He's, he's got this system in place. It shows you a pattern of compliance. So, that, you know, when you can show that, then as they go through and maybe have other questions about it, you don't have to reprove it again and again. They're like, oh, yeah, right. I understand you did that before. So. Right, and I think it's important for people to realize and remember that these IRS auditors, they're not evil transformer robots. They're actually human beings, 
And when it comes down to it, and I've seen this because I've guided clients through audits from the standpoint of I was the one who put together their financial records. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that if you have a good records, you can put together a nice audit trail for them that makes it very clear to them, here's the amount we claimed, here's the backup that supports the amount. And if you make their job easy, they're going to go away quickly and painlessly for the exactly. most part. If you make their job difficult, they're going to make your life difficult. That's pretty much been my experience. Would you agree? Yes, yeah, I, I think, you know, the nail, hammer right on the nail head. Um, just, you know, you do your job, when they, when your job intersects with an IRS auditor's job, if you've done yours, then everybody's going to go away. It, maybe not happy, but at least not as angry as they might have been. Right, right. And you'll end up with the best outcome at that point. I exactly. mean, cause, you know, if you give them a hard time, they're going to start digging deeper and looking for more things you know, just because they have to spend the time anyway. True. You know, and would you say that, it's, it's fair to say, because I've actually been hired by tax attorneys. I get hired pretty regularly by tax attorneys whose clients are being audited, and these are cases where the client has no records. So I get hired to put the records together. So I have to go dig through their bank statements and everything and come up with the plan and then bring the bookkeeper in and guide them and let, let's assemble the records here. Let's compile them. And based on my experience from that vantage point, it w it's been interesting to me to watch what the tax attorney does because I have to sign, I always forget the name of it, but there's a special uh, letter I have to sign where they essentially extend the attorney-client privilege to me. Mm -hmm. And based on that, I've been instructed every time, it's always the same thing, but I guess they, they kind of have to tell me over and over again that I am not to divulge any information directly to the IRS auditor, that it all has to go through him or her. Mm -hmm. And that essentially the reason for that is they want to make sure that they give the IRS agent as little as possible, just what they need, because the more you give them, the more it potentially opens up a can of worms. What do, what do you think about that? No, that, that's true. You know, again, we were talking about it. it's not exactly, it's not like being in a court case, uh, but, it, but one thing that is uh, similar to being in a court case, you want to tell the truth, but you, you only want to tell the truth to, to, to the question that you're asked. Don't volunteer. I mean, you might think it could help help your situation. Chances are it won't. It gives them, like you say, another area of interest to look into. Oh, that's that's why I took I took the Smiths to dinner and we talked about me writing a book about their life. And then we talked about what we could do with their their kids, uh, the, a memoir that their kids wants to do. And and. It, and you sort of go off and then the guy's going, hmm, so are you trying to use that memoir that you really haven't done or really met on to write off against this too? So, you know, you think you're being helpful, but, you know, just answer their questions, but only answer their questions. Don't volunteer information. I'm sure that's what every tax professional, EA, CPA, tax attorney is going to tell you if you're in a, an audit situation. Be honest, but only as honest as you're required to be. <laughs> Right, yeah, no, I, less is more. Just give them exactly what they need to know, nothing more. It's almost like, uh, you know, you can learn a lot from Twitter because that teaches <laughs> you how to keep your information short and to the point. <laughs> so oh, this is a good thing, so just, the, the Twitter guide to a tax audit. <laughs> well, there you go. I was just going to say, so you can tweet your answers to the tax auditor and explain that to them. Say, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to answer all your questions on Twitter. What's your handle? <laughs> 104 characters or less. <laughs> So, all right, well, uh, Kay, thank you so much for being with us. This has been great. Is there anything before we, first of all, what's your, give us your website. Tell us how to find you. Um, it's don'tmesswithtaxes.typepad.com. Um, I went that route because when I started doing this, I knew nothing about technology. And as you learned today, when I had trouble setting up the webcam, I haven't learned a lot in the five, six years, <laughs> but still. So it's don'tmesswithtaxes.typepad.com. I'm on Twitter as Tax Tweet, and um, if you go to my, my blog, there's also a link to my tax uh, Facebook page, so don't miss with Tax's Facebook page, too. Right, and of course, the links have all been provided on the page that I put together for tonight's interview. So if anybody's looking, and obviously just reach out to me, and I'll be more than happy to pass the information along. So, Kay, thank you so much once again for being here. The uh, recording will be on my YouTube channel. You're welcome to use it and post it wherever you like, and that goes for anyone and everyone else. If everyone, anyone else has questions, 
just uh, post them on the feeds here on YouTube or on Google Plus or email them to me and we'll do our best to get you the answers to your questions as quickly as possible. Before I sign off though, I, I'm sorry, I just caught this. We do have one question now uh, that Bruce posted in the chat. So Bruce, you want to go ahead with that real quick? Uh, Gina Rodkey from Pennsylvania wants to know your thoughts. Do you agree with giving the IRS uh, your QuickBooks file when they ask for it? Ah, uh, good question. Uh, is that for me? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like I said, I don't, I don't do retail tax, so um, I would not be, I would not want to give them everything. I mean, if they have a specific question about something that is recorded in there, I, I would offer to provide that. But I'm a little leery of just opening up all books to an examiner. Again, it goes back to. Are they on a fishing trip, or do they have a specific issue that they're looking for? I, I would ask them to be a little more precise in their questioning and in, in, in their are, lot are of you, inquiry. Are you allowed to say no if they ask you for that? Are you allowed to decline to give it to them? No. I, I would. I, I would ask them a, a, for a little bit of an explanation. But again, like I said, I I, I am not a retail tax preparer, so you know. Right. I, well, Bruce, what's your take on that? Uh, the way I understand the revenue ruling is if IRS requests your file, you have to turn it over with them having full administration rights. That would be what I would think. Well, that's, 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 that's the way it is. I mean, as much as I wouldn't want to do it, as you just heard, you kind of have to. And hopefully, if you have nothing to hide in the grand scheme of things. Well, the, the last I heard, the IRS only has 2,000 licenses. So there's only 2,000 people nationwide who can with the IRS that can work in QuickBooks. Oh, that's hysterical. So we can lobby for Intuit to restrict them by limiting their licenses <laughs> even more. <laughs> See, that's how we can make the laws work in our favor. <laughs> All right, on that note, Kay, thank you so much for being with us. Bruce, thank you as always for your help. And ladies and gentlemen, next week we'll have another great interview, Monday night, 5 p.m. Pacific time. We'll see you around. Thanks, Kay. Bye.